welcome everyone. Thank you. Um, and um, thank you for your patience as uh, we're getting started a few minutes late here. We are here today uh, to talk about our beloved downtown and the steps that we are taking to support its economic recovery from the pandemic and ensure that it remains what it has long been, an authentic, vibrant public space that is full of economic opportunity and one that is safe, welcoming, and inclusive for all. <clears throat> it almost goes without saying that the last two years have been a time of unprecedented challenge for our 40 year old Church Street Marketplace. The pandemic The pandemic uh, kept people out of the downtown and represented an existential threat, especially early on, that we were initially not certain we would survive without massive loss of businesses and organizations. We worked to combat that in a whole variety of ways. Very proud of the team, uh, uh, city effort and community effort that, um, uh, that protected our downtown, pre protected our organizations and businesses, worked to get Math, the massive federal relief dollars from the federal government to Burlington businesses and organizations in an equitable and uh, rapid way. And um, in 2021, our second summer of the pandemic, we saw many hopeful signs of recovery. Uh, the downtown experienced um, relatively few closures to many other organizations. Visits to the downtown and to the city rebounded. We opened the newly renovated City Hall Park and uh, the fountain that was part of it. And we saw greater use of the park that we had seen in, in, in decades with children playing and residents eating meals uh, that just weren't physically possible previously. The major festivals returned to the downtown in a somewhat modified form. And we hosted a major new Juneteenth celebration for the first time. Um, numerous retailers and hotel uh, owners have, have told me that 2021 was not just a better year than 2020, it was one of, a, one of and in some cases, the best year that some retailers uh, had ever experienced. At the same time, we experienced problematic challenges in our downtown in 2021. Too often last summer, we experienced disruptive, intimidating, and even dangerous incidents in City Hall Park and on the marketplace. With a declining number of officers, the city struggled to maintain a public safety presence in our downtown. Incidents in City Hall Park forced some youth programming to be relocated. And even while we continue to enjoy a large number of visitors to our downtown, too many of those visitors and often female employees of downtown businesses reported that they felt unsafe. Many people said they shared this with me directly, Burlingtonians, visitors, employees. And um, today we are, are taking action. Um, this kind of experience in our downtown is, is unacceptable. And what we're laying out uh, today is a plan to turn this around and to, bring, and, and, and to protect our downtown. Uh, Turning this around is not going to be easy. We continue to face heightened levels of social and economic disruption in the wake of the pandemic. And as Chief John Murad will work through in a moment, while we have begun a robust effort to rebuild the department, the number of police officers available for deployment has declined further since last year, increasing our challenge. The city is fully committed to doing all that we can to ensure that downtown Burlington continues to be a great public space where everyone feels welcome and safe. To that end, today we are announcing a downtown public safety and activation plan. There are four major elements of this plan. And I've got a number of department heads here and I'm gonna turn it over in a moment to have them walk through uh, the, these different elements, but I'm gonna outline them to start. First, in recent weeks, we have already changed the way in which our officers are deployed to increase the presence of police officers in the downtown. And Chief Murad will walk through the details of that. Second, 
we are supplementing the police presence with new and expanded investments in numerous other public safety resources. And to give you a sense of how this is gonna work, we have um, some of the members of the team that is going to augment the police um, response here with us today. First of all, we have Corporal Kevin Wilson, who uh, is a longtime um, member uh, of the department. Um, we also are joined here by uh, one of our uh, new CSOs, Nick Moore. Um, people will remember historically the city have ha has had one or two community service officers. We now um, have eight and that program may expand even further um, over the year ahead. And uh, Nick has been with us about five months and, and we appreciate his service. We're also, we have a whole new capacity that we really did not have in the police department um, before the last year, and that's our community service liaison program. Anthony Jackson Miller is uh, one of our three new CSLs, uh, also a program that we may expand further in the year ahead. And uh, uh, welcome, Anthony. Thank you for being here. Um, street outreach has long been part of the city's public safety response and representing the street outreach team. We have Tammy Buda here. The street outreach team, um, uh, in recent years um, has dropped to uh, around four street outreach workers most of the time. There's now funding in place to expand that to six. We're currently at four, but there's hope, there's optimism about uh, that expanding in the relatively near future and the funding is in place to do that. Um, we also uh, have Neil Preston here. And Neil is one of our first ever urban park rangers, which is another new program uh, launched by the city um, in the last year. Next to Nick is, is Aaron Moreau, who is uh, playing a key role managing and overseeing this new uh, Burlington Parks Recreation and Waterfront Initiative. Um, we'll have some more detail on these new programs in the, in the presentation to come. It's uh, exciting to be with all of you here today. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> um, third, th the third kind of element of this uh, public safety and activation plan is to uh, expand our capacity to offer help to individuals in need of support. And that is part of what the CSL program and the, and the uh, expanded street outreach program is about. It's also, we're not going to talk a lot about it today, happy to answer questions. It's also why we're pushing so hard to have the new Elmwood Avenue uh, Community um, Resource Center and Shelter Pod community in place. So that the city is in position to offer more help than we have in the past. And finally, um, the final element of this plan is to activate the downtown and waterfront with a record number of events over the course of the summer. Between now and the fall, there will be over 140 programmed events uh, in the downtown and waterfront area. And to speak to some of those events, that activation, uh, we have uh, Director Cindy White, Director Carol Nasrawi, and Director uh, Doreen Kraft. <clears throat> In closing, uh, I just want to add a, a few more things. I, I see this plan that we are announcing today as an important part of the community recovery, which I focused on in my State of the City last month. We've been through a historically traumatic and isolating time that has affected all of us and has made all of our social challenges as a society worse. To fully recover from this period, economically and socially, our downtown must be a place where everyone, regardless of race or class, feels safe and welcome to gather, connect, and reconnect, to eat, shop, and enjoy all that our city has to offer. To achieve this kind of downtown, we have long had and enforced basic civil laws, civic laws, and ordinances. We will continue that practice this summer, looking to the police to enforce these basic rules when necessary with patience, respect, adherence to this community's high standards for police conduct. I am grateful for the continued service of the Burlington police officers who keep our community safe. And I want all of them to know they have my support in this essential work. I also, again, wanna thank the numerous other department heads, city employees and outside partners who will implement this downtown public safety and activation plan. Um, some of those other partners I haven't recognized yet and, uh, and, and I'll wanna just take a moment to do so. I appreciate seeing Councilor uh, Joe McGee here with us 
Kelly Devine, the uh, executive director uh, of the Burlington Business Association, long time, um, <clears throat> long time key partner uh, to the city, uh, especially on down at town issues. Thank you for being here, Kelly. I don't think I um, recognize the organization that Cami works for, which is the Howard Center. I want to recognize their, their partnership in this as well. Um, our community collaborated to get through the pandemic better than just about any other city in the country through a remarkable team effort. And together, we will forge a successful recovery with the same kind of city and community collaboration. With that, I will, will now get into some of the details. I'm going to turn um, the speaking role over to, to Chief Murad. And I, I think I'm going to try to keep the PowerPoint and sync with you up here as uh, we do so. You want okay? All right, I see. We're gonna we're gonna rotate through the microphones are over here. Okay. Uh, so is the chief is he gonna advance it or are you gonna go? Okay. Okay. Well, hello everybody. Thank you very much for being here with us today uh, and uh, coming to hear some of the the plans that we have in store for the city and and particularly the downtown. Uh, I'm just going to briefly go through the plan and then obviously I think the mayor is going to make an opportunity for questions at the end and also others will speak before we get to that question period. Here's how we used to police the city. When we were a fully staffed uh, organization, we were able to engage in a community policing model that was really dedicated to having a large number of officers in specific areas around the city where those officers would have connectivity to those areas. They would get to understand the people and the problems and the potential of each area in a way that uh, was very consistent. And that steady connection was uh, incredibly important for uh, the kind of community policing that this agency and the city deserved uh, and had for about 25 years. Um, here we see a picture of that. This is an eight officer shift. Uh, this does not show supervisors. Supervisors don't answer radio calls for service, and so they're not displayed in this area model. This shows non-supervisory officers. It does not show one CSO, which was our old model, one community service officer primarily handling issues around animal control, uh, certain other kinds of tasks, assisting police officers with traffic control at scenes, uh, et cetera. We've expanded that role as we have been reduced with regard to police officers. But we had A area in the new North End, B area, which was essentially the old North End, C, which was essentially the hill section in college, D, which was the downtown core, and the E area, the south end. What we have been doing for the past year plus, as headcount fell after the decision made in June 2020, uh, we have seen fewer officers on each shift. And being unable to have eight officers and a full complement for area-based policing, we have moved to a model that was primarily covering north and south. This model uh, really had uh, functioned with six and oftentimes fewer police officers, sometimes only five or four, and still only had one CSO. What we will be doing is leveraging the CSOs that we've brought aboard as part of our public safety continuity plan, which we presented to the city council last year and the city council approved the mayor, uh, great support from the mayor in order to create this public safety continuity plan, which brought aboard additional community support officers, uh, created the community support liaison position and addresses the fact that we are not staffed the way we used to be. Historically, more than 50% of our calls for service have occurred in a circle that surrounds the downtown core. We are going to focus on that part of town where more than 50% of our calls for service are with what remains of our resources, which are fewer than 50% of historical norms. We are going to have two officers when we have four officers on a shift, and we don't every day. Some days there are fewer. But when we have four or more officers on a shift, we will have two in the downtown core, two CSOs in that downtown core, and one officer as a rover north and one officer as a rover south. We call this the city center area plan to connect it to the area model that has been so successful for the police department and which the officers inside the department are tremendously invested in. They want to be area-based community policing officers. So the city center area basically takes a bulk of what used to be B and the bulk of what used to be D and parts of what used to be C and gives that the focus of uh, the resources that we have. This may mean that response times outside this area may experience delays. An officer being assigned to the area does not mean that he or she can only patrol there. 
It means that that is where he or she is located until called elsewhere. Areas of, of proactive patrol and, and officer focus will be around the marketplace, City Hall Park, the Fletcher Free Library, uh, North Winooski Avenue, the Downtown Transit Center, and Elmwood Avenue. And it's not merely officers and CSOs who are part of this. There are a number of resources available to us that we have been both augmenting and building new. So the community service officers, again, as the mayor said, we've had these positions for many years, but normally only had one uh, on the day shift and none on the evening shift. We now have two per shift. And that is important because we have also changed our priority response model to take a number of what were priority three calls and make them CSO only response. We have the CSOs. We will have Beach and Parkers as we have in the past. They're the uh, folks who, who patrol in yellow shirts, bright yellow shirts. You'll see them on bikes on the marketplace or on the bike path. They work in the parks as well. Uh, these are oftentimes uh, students who are in between, uh, the, who are off for summer during the college years. Uh, and they are not police officers. They don't have enforcement power, nor do CSOs, but they do have the ability to be a presence for the municipality and to project that municipality's presence in a way that gives people an opportunity to ask questions, that gives the opportunity to see things that are happening and report it appropriately. They do carry radios. We will have private security, which is something that the city uh, worked with last year. Uh, the extent of that is up for, uh, is determination right now, is being determined right now. But last year we saw them in the parks. We saw them on the marketplace. We saw them here in city hall. And finally, we have uh, the community service liaison position, which again is a new position that we invented as a component of our public safety continuity plan. This has been a tremendously effective and useful role. Basically, what it does is it functions as a, uh, a, a mental health detective, almost. In the same way that patrol will take calls for service, answer those calls, address the call to the best of patrol's ability, and then say, if there's additional investigation or work that needs to be done, it's going to have to be handed off to our detectives. Patrol also goes to uh, issues that surround mental health or substance use disorder or houselessness. And they say, we are going to address the situation in front of us. We're going to put a stop to the immediate concern. But what do we do next? That's a little bit beyond our needs. And the radio is calling me for more jobs anyway. So who do I give this to? I give this to our community support liaisons. And they refer it to the CSLs. The CSLs, therefore, are both downstream. And eventually, they are upstream helpers as well. Because the more of those kinds of calls we can service properly after a police intervention, the fewer of them become a police intervention again down the road. Street outreach, and I, really I shouldn't be talking about this when the person who directs it and is the, the most expert in it is right behind us, but street outreach functions in a similar way to patrol in that it is out, it picks up calls for service at times, it also does a huge amount of proactive work, but they also do a certain amount of case management. Um, and finally, the urban park rangers, and here too, not my area to speak about, this is definitely Director White and her ability to articulate this new program, brand new to the city, that is going to have an impact on making certain that there is a municipal presence in the parks that represents uh, an ability to, to maintain a sense of order and safety. So I think with that, I'll actually step down and, and let some of those others speak if, if it's time. Great. All right, so we are incredibly excited about our new urban park ranger program. Neil Preston is our first ranger. He's three days on the job, so no challenging questions for him at the end. You can, I'll help you with those. Um, so the urban park ranger program, the whole goal of it is to provide on-site leadership, expertise, and education to our Burlington's park spaces. The program will build meaningful relationships with our community partners, citizens, and visitors. At its heart, these positions will help the city ensure our parks are welcoming to everybody, increasing the thoughtful and positive presence in our parks, utilizing tools of education to help our visitors and residents understand our park system ordinances and expectations so that everybody can enjoy our public spaces. We look forward to developing future programming within our school systems to broaden this knowledge, so, excuse me, broaden this knowledge base so that all of our students know the plethora of wonderful parks and benefits we have to offer. Uh, just a few details about the program. So we will have two full-time staff 
Um, Neil is our first one, and um, we have another uh, fellow, Andrew, that will be starting next week. It's overseen by the Waterfront Division. Erin is the head of our Waterfront Division. She's also the Harbor Master. Um, and Alec Kading is the direct supervisor. Um, some of you may have met uh, Alec. He has run our campground for many years now, and that's actually where he is today. Um, you'll see them out and about. They'll have e-bikes. They'll be on the city vehicles, and then we'll have up to about six um, seasonal staff in the summer. We'll be all working closely together. We're all one city team. Um, and so it's one where Neil has on the BPRW logo, but he'll also be in communication with CSO, CSLs, to be in communication with the street outreach. We all talk together. And that's one of the things that we'll get to when we get to events. We're one city team here um, and we all work together, even though I have the coolest logo. Sorry, Ryan. <laughs> Bye. Uh, so that's a bit about our urban park ranger program. And I'm gonna hand it over. I believe I'm handing it to Cara, who's gonna go to the next events. Great. Oh, while we're sharing. Oh, you're sharing. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. It's teamwork. Hi, I'll kick us off just by saying I think um, it's, uh, I think many of us know that when we program our public spaces, it, it creates a sense of um, fun, order, security, and it's welcoming to everyone. So um, during this time, we are very focused on making sure that we're back in full force this summer, welcoming tourists and local residents as well, and making sure there's fun activities for everyone out there in our public spaces. Um, some of these, I'm gonna leave to Doreen because I think some of these are BCA run events. Yeah, well, with everybody's help because it really <laughs> does take um, <clears throat> a village to bring this all together. And um, I just want to say that I really feel with this team that you have represented today that there is, it is Burlington throwing out the red carpet and saying, welcome, welcome back, welcome coming back from a very difficult time. We are here, we are a community, we're united, and we're going to create the best spring, summer, fall season that you've experienced in many, many years. And we're gonna do it with a lot of joy and a lot of love and a lot of creativity because the one thing that Vermont has an overabundance of, is, is that possible? No, is the creative um, economy and so many individuals that are gonna bring a, a very special meaning to um, Burlington. So we're gonna do noontime concerts, um, 24 of them throughout the summer. Um, the splash pad, if you haven't experienced the joy of screaming children and adults <laughs> running through the splash pad, please join us. There'll be parties twice a week with um, some of the best DJs in our land here to um, augment that fun. There'll be evening concerts called the Twilight Series um, uh, every other weekend, Friday and Saturday night in the evening really gonna bring quite the um, lineup of um, some of the best bands in Vermont. Um, there are flicks in the park, so outdoor movies. And during the jazz festival, for example, we're gonna be running some films with full jazz accompaniment to old silent films, pretty special night. Um, there's the spotlight, the community spotlight, which is a way that we have noontime conversations and afternoon conversations with artists in the community so that the community at large gets a chance to understand the process of making um, and creating work. Um, there's Listen Up. And then of course, the major new addition this year, <laughs> BTV Market, which is an expanded artist market with makers and micro businesses and entrepreneurs and new BIPOC businesses that are just going to bring some of the special things that are created in this community, m many of them and most of them here in Burlington, so that they can be enjoyed by the larger community, both our residents who come out and love this, as well as our visitors um, in town. So that's a little bit of a taste of what's happening, but you know, don't miss any day of the week. There'll always be something happening in the park. I feel like it's a boots in the wrong direction. You got there. No. Oh, was it the right one? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's yours. I always, I but I just want to say one thing. It's a little FOMO for me whenever I go away. 
because there's always so much fun happening at downtown that I'm always like, wait, wait, I can't go away this weekend. But thanks. For you can go away one weekend. I can? Okay. So in order to reactivate the Church Street Marketplace, we have um, revamped our cart vendor program. Um, we've added mentors and a lot of uh, new carts. Um, as part of our micro business incubator program, you'll see lots of different food and retail options on the street. We have also um, added in uh, minimum attendance requirements to ensure that the street is activated uh, as frequently as possible. Um, we have pop-up food vendors in City Hall Park on the area that we call the College Street Terrace. We did that last summer to a, a great success. Um, we're gonna have live music with family games every Wednesday on the marketplace. That'll be in front, uh, right around Homeport, right in the middle block. Um, and that's gonna be a daytime activation uh, for families. We have always have our street entertainer program, the Buskers, and we're bringing back our in the alley. As you may remember, some of these programs were suspended or limited during our pandemic, and uh, we feel that bringing these back is really going to reactivate the core of our downtown. This is not one more time. loading. Oh, there oh, we go. Oh, I got to do one. I'm going to. Oh, good. Thank you. Just do that. Let's see one more. <clears throat> There's so much going on that we use the whole slide up. All right, so lots of great major events going on in Burlington this year. Um, BPRW um, hosts some of those down on the waterfront, um, and then a lot, many of them here, City Hall Park and at Church Street Marketplace. Just calling out a few of them. One of them that already happened. We had Kids Day um, this past weekend. Um, one of the days was at City Hall Park, and it was just a great success. Ice cream, sunshine, 80 degree weather, a fountain going on a circus in the park. It was hard not to have an amazing day for our families. Um, and next up is Vermont City Marathon down at Waterfront Park and runners going out throughout the city. Um, Festival of Fools, that is quite the Burlington event. And uh, Dorian's pulled out all the stops with that one this year. And we, I think one of the things I noticed that was exciting um, is that we have Canada coming back. So we'll have performers coming up from the north um, down to Burlington, which we were not able to be able to do the past couple of years. Right. So you see the full list there, lots of great events going on, some new ones running with the bulls. I think Tara gave us a little introduction to that one, but uh, that's a new one coming to us. Um, international Boat Show, that one is not till I believe September, um, but that is a international uh, boat show that's coming to Burlington. So that's new. Um, they've always, there's the Lake Champlain Maritime Festival, they've had to stop this year. But the fall one is a national one. Boaters will be coming from all over to Burlington for that event. So you'll see just all kinds of unique classic antique boats um, in Burlington. But Juneteenth, fireworks, July 3rd, we've got it all happening here in Burlington. So we just hope everybody comes down. So many amazing events um, happening, um, all of it possible. We've got the support of the mayor um, and the city council supporting those budgets to make these possible, the businesses that help sponsor them. And of course, just all of us working together. It's one, you know, helping each other out, whether it's the expertise of BCA and all they do for putting events on to our staff to try to help make sure those parks are ready for them and Cara's team helping from the business side. So we again, hope everybody um, comes to downtown Burlington um, and play with us this summer. Well, I'll let Great. you handle that. Okay. Lead up the question. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Um, great. So, um, since we've got all the mics here, I think we'll shuttle people, people in and out as necessary. Happy to uh, take any questions that there are about any aspect of this plan. Go ahead, Kim. Just in terms of the, the idea of presence, and, and maybe Chief, you can touch on this too. Um, you know, just from, from talking with folks, I mean, whatever story it is, you know, they say, we want to see officers down here. We want to be able to see that foot traffic again. I mean, how important is it to have that presence? I know we've talked about it time and time again, but now that you have this plan, how will it work and, um, and will it work? Um, well, Cam, having a public safety presence is important. Um, and uh, we struggled to uh, provide that sufficiently last summer. And the plan that we laid out here today uh, is, is intended to do just that, is to have a, a, a stronger uh, multifaceted presence. Uh, this new police deployment uh, is part of that. Um, so there should be a, uh, it, it, we're going to have as regular presence as we can with the, the current limitations um, of the department, and we're going to augment that with all of these other uh, professionals um, uh, going forward. 
uh, that's, that's, uh, I, you know, I get, was on the radio this morning and got some feedback on the radio that people already sense uh, uh, some positive uh, difference. And we're going to be working very hard to, to continue that and, and, and build that. Chief, do you want anything else about that? Sure. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> I think part of the question is, how can we do more with less? Um, and that is sort of the picture we have. If, if this was uh, the, the model that we were working on for the past year, essentially, uh, it's six, right? This is predicated on six. So is this, but it's a different mix of six. We've lost officers. We are going to continue to lose officers for the rest of this calendar year at the least even if we are able to bring aboard officers for our August Police Academy, which I am hopeful we will, um, but we will still lose a net number of officers owing to uh, projected departures, tenure related departures, et cetera. So we've instead beefed up the number of CSOs we have. So we go from six to this. What else changes? The other thing that changes is where those are deployed. And frankly, what we are doing is focusing on the center city area which is where, again, history tells us more than 50% of our calls for service of our overall incidents occur in this area. We are putting resources specifically there in a way that this model did not. This model was about splitting the city, about having uh, equal uh, numbers of officers in both halves of the city, uh, and was an attempt to approximate this as best as we could with much limited resources. Uh, this is an effort to address the core part of the city, the city, the city center area, where we have been hearing from people that they have not felt the kinds of presence that they want to feel with regard to uh, officers, with regard to patrol. Now, a key to this model is that this is predicated on four officers being available for that shift. We don't have four officers available every shift. Uh, we have uh, amazing officers, terrific officers, but they're human. They sometimes get ill, they go sick. This one went and ran a half marathon in Antarctica. So uh, we end up having people who are not always available for us at all times. Sometimes we don't have four. If we have three, this plan is not able, and we will probably go back to this model on those days. The other issue is what is our call volume going to be? This past weekend, between three o'clock on Saturday afternoon and 4 a.m. on Sunday morning, we had 58 calls for service. 58 incidents that included gunfire incidents, included shootings, included stabbings, included domestic assaults. It was a tremendously, tremendously busy 14 hour period. If we have periods like that, then the ability for all these officers actually to be on the marketplace or actually even to be patrolling the North or the South as the Rover North and Rover South is tremendously limited because they are eaten up through that shift by the calls for service that they have to address. And while we normally stack about 13% uh, of our calls, we stacked 17% of our calls during that very, very busy period on Saturday uh, because officers were extended. Uh, that is that they were, they were overextended in their work. So those I think are answers to your questions. We are trying to do as best we can with what we've got. And I'm telling the officers that we need to make certain that we are, are hearing our neighbors needs for service that we are calling upon ourselves to do what we can for our, our business partners, for our neighbors, for the people we serve. Hearing the mayor's support on these issues is tremendously important for us and for the men and women inside the police department. We need to know that we've got the community support as well on these issues. Uh, because frankly, when we have fewer people available to us, it actually means that sometimes incidents don't go as well as we want them to go. A lot of our training is predicated on having uh, enough officers, sufficient numbers of officers to be able to handle a situation with multiple people doing multiple roles. That's a little bit stretched right now, but we're building other capacities in order to do, address that. And you see a number of them here and you hear all the extra plans that are out there beyond police about what makes this a strong community. A strong community is a strong community because it is a strong community. It sounds like a tautology, but it's not. If there are people in the downtown, there are people in the downtown. If we tell people to come and people come, that alone makes a place safer, more secure, and reinforces that safety in, in an ever-reinforcing circle. So we're hopeful that these kinds of events bring the right people into the downtown and make it in a, a place where we can actually uh, feel like the community we want to be. I'm sorry, sir. No, thank you for that, Chief. I guess I just want to add to that, you know, you, there's a couple numbers thrown out there that I think are important numbers for people to have in mind. And, you know, the chief uh, rightly um, 
wants to uh, deliver on our commitments to the public and wants to uh, doesn't want to over promise and what I think he just walked us all through is there there the, the way uh, in which um, <clears throat> uh, our our system needs to work right now there will be times when this deployment that is shown here on the map will, will not be possible um, that uh, stacking figure that he cited of 13, 17 percent in that period last uh, last weekend is a decent proxy for uh, the amount of time where we will str struggle to um, deliver uh, on this model and struggle to deliver this type of presence. So the public, uh, you know, I, I, I think what's important, and I share the chiefs, uh, there will be moments, there will be times when the public comes down and they, they're not going to see it, see exactly this. And that's one of the reasons is that there will be times that events around the city will, will require a different response. All that said, um, if, uh, if we deliver on this model 80% of the time, um, I, I think that is people are going to feel a marked improvement um, over last summer. When you add to that um, this uh, big array of new, uh, new resources, new professionals, uh, I'm, I'm confident that, um, like was said earlier, the city is going to feel open and welcoming again, and uh, we look forward to seeing everyone back downtown this year. Well, I was just wondering, um, I know that you've met, you're talking about you've met the, the way to kind of add a more inclusive atmosphere to the downtown, but don't events like the marathon, the fireworks also require more staff? You want to speak to that, Chief? I mean, it does take different types of posture. They do require different kinds of staffing. Uh, so the, the marathon is in a different route this year, and it's actually going to require fewer police officers because it is not using as many roadways. And as a result, it doesn't have to have as many uh, police officers controlling intersections. Uh, by Vermont law, a lighted intersection has to be controlled by a police officer, whereas other kinds of intersections, stop signs, et cetera, can be controlled by volunteers even. Uh, we do use our community service officers. Uh, we have used other employees to do non-lighted intersections. The marathon's route change means that we're going to be able to service that with, with fewer officers than we have in the past, but we also routinely bring in outside agency officers for that event. Actually, outside agencies love to sign up for that event because it's a wonderful day, and uh, it's uh, terrific crowds and generally is a really fun time. The 3rd of July is a little different. That has always been a Burlington Police Department purview, and dealing with the numbers of people that we have uh, coming into the city has always been Burlington's task. Uh, we do not use outside agencies for that, with the exception of a handful of UVM officers or South Burlington officers up at the jug handle or on the campus where the buses depart. And we usually get assistance from our partners at the Vermont State Police. Very, very grateful for that with regard to their tactical units that will be uh, in the, the waterfront area. But the bulk of the uh, policing that is at the major areas of the waterfront, Oak Ledge Beach, uh, at North Beach, and then the traffic out uh, after the event, which is the biggest issue, has always been done by Burlington Police. We are going to be very differently staffed for that this year, and we are not staffed nearly the way we have been in the past. So last year it functioned, and last year was a smaller than normal July 3rd. If this is a fully sized July 3rd, uh, we're going to have some changes on where parking and, and uh, outflow traffic happen. And do you mind while you're up there? Day, uh, yes. When, when do those shifts begin? Sure. So we didn't. We have not changed our shift structure. Our shift structure remains a three shift structure. Uh, we have a day shift that essentially goes from 7:45, 7:30 uh, until 17:30. Uh, we have a um, evening shift that goes from 16:45 to 02:45, and then we have a midnight shift that goes from 10-15 uh, until 8-15. No, the midnight shift does not have four officers, it has two. That model looks more like this, except that it's uh, really just, it is a coverage of the entire city. There's not even a cover north, cover south. I guess, especially where you have, I mean, the incidents that we've seen this last weekend during that, kind of late hours, I mean, having to pull guys in and guys and gals in 
and, and to do that, I mean, how, how much of a struggle is that going to be kind of moving towards this, this model as well? Well, it's a struggle with moving towards this model or just a struggle in, in general? In general, I mean, especially where you have the bulk of your, you know, your gunfire incidents happening in the early morning hours or, you know, the stabbings happening late at night. I mean, um, when you think it might help address that issue in terms of that, that time of the day, I mean, kind of what, what should folks expect? Well, as it turned out, the fact that we'd had a stabbing uh, around two in the morning was uh, a good thing because then we had enough officers on hand for the 4 a.m. shooting. Uh, and we had not sent them home at the shift end and had not and had actually called some in as well to assist. So we really wouldn't have had the same kinds of resources for that 4 a.m. gunfire shooting incident. Um, the, you know, we're going to deal with this as we deal with it. And on some level, this is something that we've always had to experience. It's just been of a different scope and scale. So it is always possible that some sort of cataclysmic event could happen and overwhelm even a fully staffed police department. Uh, and you have to do with what you can with what you've got. We simply are in a different kind of position right, right now with regard to staffing. But as, uh, you know, in my, in my history as a police officer, I've been at multiple major events, including the, the Boston Marathon bombing, the Chelsea bombing in New York City. Those are events that, that frankly, can overwhelm even fully staffed agencies. And you deal with what you can deal with and you function in the way you can. We're going to be doing that a little more often than perhaps we would like, but we will be doing it to the best of our ability and with the, the best ability and the best to give that the men and women inside the Burlington Police Department have. What is the headcount at right now? 66 on the books, 57 effective. It's 57 who are available for patrol at this moment. How does that compare to a year ago? A year ago, uh, we were at, I wouldn't know the exact date a year ago, the exact a year ago, but I believe we were in the low 80s a year ago. Do you expect that number to drop off at all? Yes. No, not exactly. It would be prognostication. What percentage of calls for service happen? During the day uh, percentage is low, but the number of calls for service that are of a higher priority is disproportionate and goes up. Um, but I don't have the exact figures. It was a component of a heat map that we published when we talked about the possibility of not having a midnight uh, shift. Um, it is uh, a good deal. It, it certainly does. There are fewer incidents at that time, but many of those incidents become more significant mostly because quality of life incidents require somebody awake to be bothered by the kind of incident that it is. Somebody's, uh, you know, too noisy or something's happening and people are asleep, then those kinds of quality of life, uh, those kind of quality of life incidents are, are not noticed, but big ones are. So the midnight shift would be the types of incidents that maybe a CSO or a CSL would not technically respond to? That is correct. That requires that. That's correct. We have a pilot present you want to speak to that for the chief? I mean, there has been some success with, with uh, recruitment, but it's uh, slow and, and it's Work yeah, so uh, obviously we were incredibly grateful for the city council's partial reversal of uh, the decision in June of 2020 and moving to uh, a headcount of 87. Um, what we have been able to do is hire again and start hiring and at least being able, a, even able to advertise. Uh, what we're facing is a challenge that has been something uh, facing the entire state and in fact the entire country and the profession of policing around the United States. There are not a lot of folks who are trying to come into this profession right now. We have brought aboard a total of three people since the, uh, the decision was made by the council to allow us to hire again. Uh, of those, one uh, did not complete. One is in the academy and one is in his field training on the streets right now. Uh, I have high hopes for both of those two officers. The one who's in field training, exemplary officer, uh, was a former member of the street outreach team. Uh, so we know that uh, that person has experience and a certain uh, philosophy of, of interaction that is something we value and want. The officer who's currently in the police academy, also somebody for whom I have a lot of hopes, uh, we're working to hire. Um, and my training officer, excuse me, my recruitment officer has a lot of plans, put together an advertisement that we did on WCAX. 
uh, is working hard at making sure that we keep up with candidates in ways that we haven't in the past. We're much more proactive about really engaging with them, trying to bring them in and, and not lose them and let them wriggle off the hook, as it were. But ultimately, what we need is we need a, a system that allows us to compete uh, directly with our local peers and ultimately with regional peers as well in order to bring people into the profession, not as recruits, but as what we call lateral police officers, people who are already certified police officers elsewhere in Vermont or in other states who can be brought aboard in a, in a somewhat quicker fashion and be officers on the street faster than a recruit who has to go through the police academy. Um, to do that, we need to change our narrative. We need to be able to tell our story uh, and, and be able to really connect with the people who we hope to make members of this team. To just, sorry. just want to add to that real quick. The, the, so the chief described the, the, this rebuilding plan has begun. We are doing some new things we haven't done before, like these uh, television advertising. Um, on this coming Monday, the uh, uh, Chief is going to be laying out his um, the budget proposal for the council for the next year, and as, as part of that, uh, we'll be laying out a uh, kind of the next stage of that a, a uh, robust uh, rebuilding plan um, that will be you know, resourced and that will uh, involve um, a number of additional uh, new initiatives to uh, retain and, and and recruit both new officers and laterals. So it's uh, really we'll. we'll We'll be ready, really focusing on that uh, on Monday, um, and but it's 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 a key part of this uh, uh, related effort. So uh, what you're describing is, is actually a, a misreading of uh, that was a that was a long article that that uh, I believe misrepresented what we had uh, communicated, which was that we were in this model. We were no longer in an area model. We were in this cover north, cover south model that's shown here. Uh, and the uh, the the move from an area based model, this one, to this one, uh, was predicated on the number of officers available. Uh, that in and of itself is not a contractual issue. Shifts are a contractual issue. When officers pick their time to work is a contractual issue. Uh, how they are assigned in order to, and deployed throughout the city is a day-to-day -day operational decision. Uh, and what we had at that time was a system that was largely moving north-south because we had already dropped below the numbers available for a true area-based model. Um, what the question at hand was, how many officers were available at a given time in the downtown area? And again, because we were splitting north-south, that was not a relevant question. It was the wrong question about whether or not we were in D area. We weren't in any areas at that point. We were splitting the city north-south, which we have been doing for the past year. Um, again, this is a change with regard to saying that we are now going to have a city center area uh, but one that then uh, creates a little bit of, uh, of changing the amount of service in the north and the south uh, for the center core. The idea of north-south was a, a more evenly distributed amount of service across the city, but that's one that we are seeing that we need to really focus in on this downtown center area instead. How quickly can you shift from north-south to the center? It's happened. I, I think, like you mentioned, that there's a number of officers who don't show up for whatever reason, sick or whatever, and you shift back to the north south. Is that like a, a call that could be made previously? Or? Yes, that's a that's a determination that would be made by the officer in charge on a given shift. Okay. So there's only three of us today. Uh, maybe because somebody's running a half marathon in Antarctica, uh, and so we're going to be doing north south. Uh, and maybe we don't even do north south if there's only three. Maybe we do coverage across the whole city. Uh, that's going to be a determination made by an OIC based on how many resources. And there's also the question of whether or not somebody's going to be coming in partway through the shift at noon. Um, but there's some other things in the works as well for us to try to maximize the resources that we have. Uh, but ultimately, the answer to your question is it's a determination by the officer in charge. Um, number of gunfire incidents across the year, and then can you just touch on the morale? So the number of gunfire incidents, I believe, is eight. I think that that is the, the number that we are at. Um, 
I'll, but I, I might have to get back to you on that one. Um, there was a, uh, what is morale? You know, morale inside the department is, is a tough question. I think that there are different kinds of morale. There's internal morale, and then there is sort of extra morale. The internal morale of how do I work with my coworkers? How do I feel about the mission I have? How do I feel about this work? Actually, I think it's pretty high right now. I think there is a sense of camaraderie and teamwork inside the agency that is laudable and is a testament to the, the men and women and the degree to which they want to serve this community. They are uh, your officers. They're our police officers. With regard to other kinds of morale, how they feel with regard to exhaustion, with regard to working more overtime than we historically have seen before, uh, with regard to feeling that they're not entirely staffed the way they want, with regard to feeling that they can't deliver on the way, uh, on the kinds of policing that they historically have delivered and want to deliver, then you have a different kind of picture. Uh, and nobody wants to feel that they are less than their best. No one wants to feel uh, that, uh, you know, they are not delivering what they are trained or empowered or accustomed to delivering. And that definitely can have an impact. Um, how do you think that the department's new function of the should be viewed from a top down? Are there kind of natural groups of leaders that could go and kind of that could be supported? From my perspective, it's not up in the air. Uh, it's the reason I felt urgency to make a decision uh, uh, at the end of a long search process uh, to, uh, to have it, the stability of having a chief that would be able to do exactly what we're talking about today, roll out uh, plans that are the function of uh, many months of, of planning and collaboration and discussion, um, strategic initiatives. That's very hard for, uh, uh, I think it's challenging for an acting chief to do with a, um, uh, a um, uncertain timeline. Um, you've seen this plan today. This rebuilding plan is coming out in days to come. Um, you're going to see uh, next week um, uh, a significant um, uh, uh, data report, statistical report being issued that the the chief has has supported as well. Um, the, all of that, um, I think we are a far better place today to be able to to do this work, roll out these initiatives, make forward. Uh, uh, progress um, because we have uh, stability in, in the chief's position. Um, uh, it is, I think, what you know. Clearly, you're referring to the fact that um, it, that that, that uh, confirmation of the chief resulted in a six-six uh, council split, and um, you know, it is something I still have some ongoing conversation with counselors about, and and hope that it does. So I think it would be better if we could get to a place where um, uh, there's uh, this full confirmation. But we're already in a better place than we were um, during the extended period without clarity about leadership at the top. And last one for me, um, in terms of the <clears throat> for downtown, how involved were businesses or how much input did you kind of take in from businesses from last year? I mean, we've heard a lot from business owners over the last year plus that uh, about concern and about a sense that the city needed to do more. and. Um, uh, we also heard that from residents. We also heard that from visitors. And um, uh, what we've been communicating today is a response to that and, and, and our commitment to take action and to, uh, to deliver to people the type of safe, inclusive, welcoming downtown for all that, that uh, yes, our, our businesses, but also the public and visitors expect. Sorry. 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 It was May 1st, basically. May 1st is uh, when the, the way the police officer tours, um, uh, as they refer to them, uh, work. Um, there's some, a new deployment um, that uh, is, is sorted out um, every, I mean, your help here, Chief, it's been yes, every, every three, three month period that- Yes, sir. Uh, it, it's four months. There are uh, three four-month tours in, in a year, uh, and officers are assigned. They bid on that based on seniority and decide whether or not they want to be on the evening shift or on the midnight shift. Um, and I think your question actually goes back to last year in May. And essentially, if, if you look at the article that I believe you're referring to, it actually mentions that we were in north-south posture then. It just buries it at the bottom of the article. We were in a north-south posture by May of 2021. 
And we've been in this one, which is this, uh, since that point. Yeah, officers did still have areas in that. That is a roster, and those area those officers have uh, areas assigned in their roster. But they were running north south almost every single shift, and it was a matter of saying that we can't have that we didn't have enough for specific areas. As a result, we were covering in order to in order to maximize coverage across the entirety of the city. We moved to a north south model rather than saying that tonight we're just not going to have anybody in C or anybody in A. Instead, we said, we're gonna split the city and have north and south. And if we had six on, it was three and three. If we had five, it was maybe two and one and three and the other. If we had seven or eight, then sometimes we would go back to that area model. Uh, and there's some shifts where you have both sides of a shift in at the same time, and therefore you were big enough that you could have the area model. Uh, but it was, it was in great flux. And basically every single shift was, uh, was an uncertainty. It was uncertain how many you'd have, which is the same as it's been. We were doing firearms training for most of April. And as a result, we never had what we would call a double day. There were most days we were running three on a shift instead of four. Uh, so the, the, the ways in which assignments happen in those instances are not as simple as looking at a sheet. They're a day-to-day -day decision that has to do with what you've got and whether or not you have certain conditions that are rising in, in this part of the city or in that part of the city and where are you gonna put your resources. That is correct. In the midnight shift, we have two officers. Uh, there are two. Actually, actually, I'm sorry. I think it may be three on on one side of the shift. Have fewer at the daytime then. Everything is a just everything is a decision to rob Peter to pay Paul at this point. So contractually, we could do that because you say that officer bid on something. It would be it would be a matter of rebidding. But that would it's possible because the provision in the contract does allow officers to switch the middle of the floor to a particular portion. We would probably be able to do it, and it might be a grievance, but that would be it might be a, a contractual issue. For the, for the most part, uh, there'd have to be a, a specific reason to say we don't need as many on the day as we need on the midnights. The data tells us that the midnights are the slowest period of time. And therefore, that's when that we staff based on volume. I think that's a key point. This, the, the, what this represents, what this map represents, what we've been trying to communicate to, today is a prioritization um, of uh, staffing, using our limited resources to staff daytime hours, daytime shifts, and to focus them to uh, a degree that has not been the case until now um, on the downtown center city area where we have a disproportionate number of, uh, of incidents. This is a data-oriented approach. This is essentially this, that um, rectangle there, more or less rectangle, is within that area is when, where more than 50% um, of the incidents over the course of a year take place, and we're um, dedicating um, half of our officers and uh, centering these these additional CSOs um, in that area and supplementing that with the other the other initiatives that we talked about today. Um, Again, we've, uh, we've been in this posture, this new posture since May 1st. There's some early indications from conversations I've had with downtown stakeholders that uh, the difference is being felt. And we are um, very committed to uh, continue to work on this and, and, and have this be a success. It, it is essential from, from my perspective for Burlington to, con you know, to continue to be what it's always been. We have to be a place that feels safe and welcoming to everyone. And this uh, new posture and all these other resources and initiatives is, uh, is, how, is how we're going to achieve that. Appreciate you all being here and being with us for a long time. And uh, we'll, we'll talk to you all again soon. Thank you.